Greetings, travelers. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Erie Travels. I am your host, Mark Muncy, the author of Erie, Florida, Freaky Florida, Creepy Florida, and now Erie, Appalachia. And speaking of that, that's where we'll be traveling for some of today's episodes, because tonight's episode, we are watching the skies. Yes, the truth is out there. We're going to be talking about alien encounters and some UFOs of historical note, some folklore tales, and, you know, possibly one Florida tie to the men in black phenomena that also ties in to Mothman, everybody's favorite cryptid. And what we'll be doing is we will be investigating this wonderful creature called the Flatwoods Monster. We'll also be talking about the Crestview sighting, and we'll be also talking about the man himself, Indrid Cold, and probably the most infamous of all, the Gulf Breeze sightings in the panhandle of Florida, and the late Ed Walters. But to begin with, we have to go back to probably the most famous of all UFO crashes was Roswell. 1947. And it has gone down in history, rightfully so, as one of the most significant UFO events. 1952, just a few years later, the town of Flatwoods, West Virginia, would be forever put on the map as well, almost as famously as Roswell, though it was initially debunked. Now, we have to go to a Florida incident that same day. This day in Tampa Bay, a flight was flying from Pensacola into MacDill Air Force Base. When it landed, it was re-scrambled instantly. No one really knows why. The day records from the base are redacted. All that was known was that these two men who flew up were reportedly downed in a training accident. So I do the quotes because you got to do that when you talk about these things. It was redacted. The families don't know what happened. And they were told little. The, it was supposed to be a flight from Pensacola to Tampa. Why were they re-scrambled immediately? Well, there were a lot of unidentified flying object reports seen over Tampa Bay. This would have been a ready plane and it would have been scrambled to investigate. The current theory is that these two pilot and the training pilot may have encountered something unusual, a strange aircraft, and may have damaged it. According to some of the witnesses, there was a dogfight in the sky over Tampa that day. Now, the damaged craft had it continued on the trajectory because it had been seen a little further south uh, over Fort Myers. It had been seen a little ways out over the Keys. If it continued on that northwesterly track, and a, a damaged craft might have crashed into an area along this line, which just a short edge over is the town of Flatwoods, Kentucky, in, near Sutton. Uh, Flatwoods, West Virginia, near Sutton, West Virginia. And this town, two young boys are out playing baseball and they see the crash of the craft and they run and get their brothers. The brothers running home up the hill to see this thing, one of the brothers is a National Guardsman and he's leading them up. He's off duty and you know, there. And the boys grab their mom. And then when they get up to the site, there's this strange flashing the strong aroma, this crazy stench that they can't get out of their nose. And then through the trees comes what is known now as the Flatwoods Monster. This thing had red face with glowing eyes. It had a long shell body. And there's Braxy himself at the Flatwoods Monster Museum, um, reinterpreted. Uh, but these glowing eyes, he was 15 feet tall, and he made no noise as he hovered towards them. And they do say hovered. He didn't touch the ground. There was a strange mist about him. Now, the initial reports did not say arms. 
said it had like antenna coming out of its shoulders, but they could see reptilian-like features behind the eyes, which they described as portholes. So this could have been some sort of capsule with a creature inside it. Now, the family fled at this point and ran back down the hill and went to get help. By the time police and other authorities arrive, there's nothing there. So an initial sketch, this was done for a New York television show uh, that they would later appear on, drew the arms, drew the skirt pleating, and is what most become associate with the Flatwoods monster right, you know, currently. But to be fair, the original description did not mention arms anywhere. Now, Project Blue Book would be brought out. Now, Project Blue Book was the Air Force's program for researching unusual encounters. Uh, they went to debunk this situation, as they were paid to do. And uh, Dr. Hynek noted that uh, the eyes of the witnesses were irritated and had been exposed to some strange chemicals uh, in the air that would explain the weird smell. Uh, one of the reporters in the area spotted this weird oil in the area, but there was no crashed object, no sign of the creature, but there were lots of military treads in the area. Now the police arrived a short while later because they had been investigating a reports of a downed aircraft, which would match our story of our crashed flying saucer. They never found the aircraft. There was no reported bodies or anything, but this creature was reported and was seen. Now, Braxton County hosts the Flatwoods Monster Festival every year. Uh, it's actually over in the town of Sutton nearby where the Flatwoods Monster Museum is. They have these giant chairs that are the exact size and specifications of the creature. And they are spread out at five key locations in the county and you're supposed to go to the five different locations, each connecting to a different part of the Flatwoods Monster lore. Uh, one chair is where the initial sighting occurred. One chair is where the uh, military showed up. One chair is near where the family farm was. Um, it's, they're fascinating and it's a neat little scavenger hunt to complete while you're there in Flatwoods. The town also has a wonderful item that's unique to there. They, in the 1940s, a man made a lantern out of ceramic uh, that was shaped like the Flatwoods monster. And you could put a candle in it and his eyes would light up. They still sell those there and there they are. And you can get the Flatwoods monster shirt, which I always recommend the one that glows in the dark. That's the one that's seen there based on that original illustration. They have tons of unique bits of Flatwoods monster history and lore. There's the lantern's original mold. Uh, and you can see all the amazing collection in the Flatwoods Monster Museum, which is the Sutton County Historical Society. And the Flatwoods Monster is super popular in Japan for some reason. Uh, he's made appearances in several video games and uh, famously uh, inspired a couple creatures in Pokemon. And uh, not sure why he is as popular as he is over there, but here we are. Now, the next place we need to go to is Gulf Breeze, Florida. And we mentioned Florida having UFO flaps in the past. In the 1980s, up in the Panhandle near Pensacola, right near Eglin Air Force Base and the Pensacola Naval Station, there were numerous sightings of unusual aircraft. Um, people didn't know what they were seeing in the skies and started reporting it over and over to authorities. Now the Air Force logged all these because this was right at the end of Project Blue Book, but they were still logging these accounts. Project Blue Book had become famous by this point, so this is why this one's probably one of the most documented. But one man named Ed Walters caught some of the most spectacular UFO photographs ever captured on film. And he posted these on newspapers at the time and sold a book of these pictures and he even had an alien encounter of his own. Now these photos are quite spectacular and I think we're going to pull one of them up here in a moment. Are we Rob? Oh yeah there we go. Well 
spoilers, they were fake. Uh, when he sold his house years later, they found the model up in his attic. Now, Ed Walters swears that he was framed by the FBI as disinformation, that he really did take these photos and had these alien encounters when he wrote his story. These are the original photos. And as you can see, they look very similar to that model, but they are quite stunning. His book is quite a collector's item. Uh, Gulf Breeze tourists often go to the sighting of this picture where the aircraft landed um, and look for, the, there's actually a marker sprayed on the sidewalk to show that location. Now, Ed claimed he could duplicate these photos when he saw the aliens because he could be reaching with them. He saw, took many photos of them. He was in communication with them. And they sent a visitor to see him. And he described it as a tin man with a strange robot head and that it would look in his window at night. But it was only four or five feet tall, unlike our friend Braxy, who was a nice six or seven feet tall, uh, or maybe even 10 or 15 feet tall, depending on the version of the Flatwoods monster story. Now, the Gulf Breeze, there's Ed's description of the creature and his drawing. And as you can see, had a weird mask. It had strange gray colors. Uh, could not distinguish the hands or fingers, uh, and it was possibly shields. Looks like it was. Looks like a cardboard box monster. Myself, uh, he could not get photo of the alien itself, but he tried his best to see what he could find. And now we go to our next location, which is back up in West Virginia. Now there's a man just before the Mothman craze hits, who was driving home from Parkersburg, and he was in a box truck, and as he's driving along the road, his name is Woodrow Derenberger, and while he's driving home, something strange happens. He sees this truck in front of him fly past, not unusual on a highway in uh, the 1950s, but the thing behind it, chasing it, is what he called a chimney shaped vehicle that was hovering or flying and chasing that truck and then suddenly it stopped in front of him it slowed him down and it turned and it looked like two kerosene lanterns turned on their sides and then it forced him over to the side of the road where it landed and out of it stepped a man a human man wearing a bright green suit, kind of shiny, even sparkling. The man smiled at him, walked slow, asked him to roll down his window. And he rolled down his passenger window, leaned over and did it. The man stood beside the car, said, hello, my name is Indrid Cold. I am a traveler and I have questions. He called himself a searcher and that he was from the planet Lanulus in the Ganymede galaxy and that he was here to discover all he could about Earth and its inhabitants. Now, Derenberger said he never opened his mouth. He heard all these questions in his mind, and the man merely smiled at him and assured him that he meant him no harm repeatedly and that all would be well. He talked to him over and over for nearly an hour. Other cars would pass, Woodrow swears that people saw this and just kept going. The man who talked to him was Indrid Cold, and there's the smiling man. Now, a short time into it, Indrid said, thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Derenberger. You will be hearing from us again, and stepped back into his craft, where he saw another hand reach out and grab him and pull him in. And then the vehicle shot up into the sky. Now, he returned home, didn't know what to tell anybody. His wife insisted that he tell the police and possibly the press to see if anybody else could verify his story. I had a feeling she wasn't 100% buying it. But several drivers reported seeing him on the side of the road with the strange craft. So there were several witnesses to this event. Um, 
it's a crazy story. And Tanya Derenberger, his daughter, claims that Indrid Cold repeatedly visited their home. And there she is. Uh, and he would come to them many days and he would visit them over and over again. Now, this incident is, you know, infamous because John Keel included Indrid Cold in his book, The Mothman Prophecies. He was intrigued by the whole Indrid Cold incident and tied it in to the Mothman legacy, even though they are miles away. But in the Mothman Museum, you can find the original recordings of the interview that the local newspaper did with Derenberger about Indrid Cold. And you can find that complete transcript and the audio of it online through the Mothman Museum and several other YouTube archives. But where it ties back to Florida, I was investigating an incident for a new book and it was called The Crestview Sighting. It happened around the same time, about six months after Derenberger's encounter with Indrid in the Miami area. This is Crestview Elementary and right near the Miami-Dade Air Force Base. And a bunch of students, hundreds of students, are out playing and they all get called in from recess. And one boy is just staring up at the sky. And the teacher comes over and says, you know, Jimmy, you need to get in. And the, Jimmy goes, well, what's that? And he sees a strange light in the sky. They both look up at it, assuming it possibly something from the nearby air base. And then it starts getting closer. And they realize it's a saucer. And they had heard a lot about flying saucers in the area because that was big news at the time. And um, they watched it for a few minutes, and it flew away. They went back inside finally a little late, and Jimmy told everybody about the strange thing he saw, and the teacher didn't think anything else of it. The next day, everybody was talking. What did Jimmy see? What did Jimmy see? It came back, and this time everyone saw it, and it brought friends. The large saucer craft brought little smaller craft, which what we now kind of refer to as the Tic Tac size, the little small cylindrical ships. And they were circling this giant saucer ship, and it came right to the edge of the schoolyard. There was no keeping the kids in class at this point. Everyone ran out, teachers, students. They all went to the edge of the field where the fence was and watched this thing land. And it spun around. The little vehicles did maneuvers all around it for a long period of time. And while they were doing this, they just were thrilled because this was like watching a show. And as you see, the newspapers report about it and they don't know what to talk about it. It was, you know, they say it was a copter. It was a lot, one of the students said it was a helicopter. The military show up and start interrogating the witnesses after the things have flown away. And they don't know exactly what to make of this. They, the Air Force, the Navy, one of the kids said, eh, it looked like helicopters. So that became the cover story. It was helicopters. That's what the newspaper said the next day. The UFO is only helicopters. So what does that you know, leave us with? Well, this is where it ties back in. The advent of social media, the advent of sharing stories, and the advent of things like that really made it so that we could start talking about these incidents. For a long time, this was just a footnote in UFO folklore. But what happened was the Navy documents released showing some strange, unusual craft. They looked an awful lot like some of those things those kids saw back in the day. Many of those kids, now in their 60s and 70s, still remembered that incident. And they started sharing themselves on social media saying, that wasn't a helicopter. This is what I saw. This is closer to what I saw. So they started reaching out to places, and I was able to interview one of the witnesses. When I went to his home, he had a logbook from his dad that had logged the military men who came to his home to interrogate him. And 
There were a couple officers named, but the name that caught my attention was the third name, and it just said government man. And that name was Cold. So it was Andrew Cold working for the government at this time? Did he work for the government back at that time? Was our smiling man all around since then? He's inspired lots of other creations and imitators, and some say he inspires dreams and even others. Now, while we were doing this, we got to push this little bit of information out in our book, Erie Appalachia. But right before that, we got to spend some time with Seth Breedlove of Small Town Monsters, and he put us in one of his documentaries called On the Trail of UFO's Dark Skies. And I believe we have the trailer. Now the left corner of my eye, I noticed something like uh, reflecting in the sky. And I paid more attention to it after, you know, I noticed it. And it looked like like a mirror, like something was reflecting, like a light was reflecting off of a mirror. And there may or may not have been smaller, like little uh, detail, like where it might have been multiple different lights or it might have been different panels of something reflective. There's just something about the, the hills and the hollows of this area that, I mean, especially the light quality and the, the dawn or dusk, like I've seen all kinds of lights and stuff in the sky. I'm not prepared to say what it is, but you know, I've seen plenty of things and, and I feel like, again, our brain has this false pattern recognition and we put together the puzzle in a certain way to make sense of our experiences. And, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff out there that we don't understand. It could be, it, you know, it, it is an, a sacred area, especially the Ohio Valley among the Native American tribes. It was also an area that they were afraid of for some reason and they considered it cursed in some way. And the Appalachian Mountain Range is the oldest mountain range in the world. It's, it's a landmark that hasn't really changed other than the fact that it's been eroded and weathered away. But the course is still here. It's a known target range. And thanks Seth Breedlove and Shannon Legro of Into the Fray. And you can find that at smalltownmonsters.com. You can also find it on Amazon Prime where currently it's available for Prime members for free viewing. Uh, definitely give it a shot and you'll hear some more about my encounter with Indrid Cold through my research. And um, you can also find more about us at eerietravels.com. You can follow us at Erie Florida and you can follow us on all the social media platforms as well. Now, we will be traveling quite a bit coming up uh, for the Mothman Festival in September. We will be doing uh, the Lizard Man Festival in South Carolina, and these are all creatures that we will cover or have covered in previous episodes, which you can find at webeamtv.com slash eerie travels, and um, eerie dash travels. And um, you can also just Google us and find us. Uh, but anyway, we'd like to thank the Flatwoods Monster Museum for hosting us for some of this episode's wonderfulness. And we also would like to point out that you can visit them online and order your own Flatwoods Monster Lantern if you can't make it out there. Now, if you do make it out there, Sutton, West Virginia has a Flatwood Monsters Festival that they've just begun. It's not quite as big as the, the Mothman Festival, but it's only a few weeks before. So if you want to make a nice extended stay vacation in the mountains of West Virginia, you can hit that. You can hit Flatwoods and Mothman all in the same month. It's pretty epic and a lot of fun. And who doesn't want to be in West Virginia in the fall when that is just so beautiful up there? Now, 
you can also, please, if you see anything unusual in the skies, if you have any unusual alien encounters or things you just don't understand, please report them to the Mutual UFO Network's reporting group, MUFON, or reach out to your local UFO chapter, which I'm sure has a Facebook group, I'm sure has a Facebook page or a YouTube page, and reach out to them, document it, document, 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 so that way it doesn't become like the Crestview incident, which became a footnote for 50 years before it was finally researched again in the 2000s. And now these people are sharing e with each other, and now they know they weren't crazy. They saw unusual things. This was stuff that could be documented. Now, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, we can research some of those officers that we have the names for that interrogated these kids. And we can maybe find a relative or somebody who might have some more information that we can research. But thank you so much for joining us for these eerie travels. And we will see you again soon. Please, when you do travel, travel safe, get permission. Keep watching the skies, and as always, we'll see you on the other side.